Um, essentially, there are different methods of control. None of them are magical. They all require personal rigor, uh, and it is essentially what guarantees that the research becomes, um, as we like to say, rigorous and academically sound. The first one, triangulation, I mentioned several times, is where essentially you imagine a triangle, you are on one of the points, and you look for other sources of literature that discuss the same issue, and you look for other writers that discuss the issue, but are perhaps in other disciplines, that might be the case. The idea is, with triangulation, that you always double check that what you are finding is something that can be validated. Now, of course, that would not be the case if you have truly an invention. If you are coming up with a completely new idea, you will not find anyone who's written about it, but you will most certainly find others who have written about similar developments in their thinking, most likely. Um, and again, the point of triangulation is to show that not only have you got an understanding of what others have written, but you can show that your point of view can be legitimate because others have written on similar issues, related issues. So if you're really coming up with a new approach to teaching responsible behavior, you can look at other schools and literature where teaching the values that lead to responsible behavior are being taught, whether they are religious schools in Pakistan, or whether they are California jail authorities, you might suddenly find that there is a similarity between, uh, you know, the madrasas in Pakistan and uh, teachers in California public jails. It might very well happen, and it would be a fascinating discovery to find that values that teach responsible behavior already are being taught elsewhere in a completely different worlds. So that's what triangulation is for. It's your own self-checking. Participant checking is, of course, asking others who understand your field to some extent and ask them to help you. They become your peers. So you can exchange reading each other's work, commenting as critically as you possibly can. In fact, as an academic, we should not want any kind readers. We only want nasty readers. Who will criticize us? Now, this is up to you. Clarity in descriptions. And a good critical reader should be telling you, all on a moment, you haven't clearly defined this aspect of your definition. Or you've missed out on something. Um, clarifying bias is not an easy one. We all have biases. There is no such thing as objective, neutral research. It just does not exist. Even the most scientific, laboratory-based, uh, analytical, uh, call it what you like, research, it always has its biases. It starts off with biases, with um, hidden assumptions, and the more critical you are, the more critical your peer readers are, the better for you. And there's nothing wrong with working with assumptions. Just spell them out. Just as you're spelling out your boundary, in a footnote, you can easily spell out, I'm fully aware that this approach can be accused of being biased because I'm only looking at a specific angle to my problem. However, I'm only taking this angle because it's the only one that's relevant for my specific question. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. The error happens if you hide or if you pretend that there is no bias or if no one warns you about it and you're unaware of it. Then, of course, in the peer review when you want to publish your article, someone will come back and say, ah, oh, rewrite. Obviously, honesty and transparency. Transparency is part of it. Another line that I would add here is also ethical, the ethical dimension to research. Um, you have to be careful when you do research that you maintain ethical standards that, that reflect transparency and honesty, um, but also that are according to the discipline. In certain disciplines, ethical standards will be different from others. Uh, in sociology, there will be ethical standards that will dictate that you cannot uh, ask interview questions that are manipulative. 
Um, in scientific research, there will be standards uh, that prevent you from mixing different assumptions because they, will, you know, some of them may be considered ethically wrong. <coughs> so be careful and do a bit of background reading on that if you have questions. You don't want to be accused later on of being both biased or, you know, and or unethical. Um, time and experience is, of course, something that comes with writing and publishing and researching, but. If you are doing uh, control of quality and you are referring to other authors who are all just writing their dissertations, you will be criticized for basing your research on other authors who do not have a lengthy and thorough experience of research. You must refer also to writers and researchers who are known for their lengthy experience and uh, development in the discipline. Peer debriefing is what I really just said above. You want peers to be critical and to uh, criticize your writing. Auditing is another way of quality control, and that is where you get other people who act as neutral auditors, essentially like uh, auditing a business, auditing financial accounts. It's, they would essentially do a background check about your sources, where you get your information and help you with that. That's a tough one and it's done very rarely in normal academic research because it is so, um, it's so heavy and so uh, costly. But if you can actually form a team, if three of you can agree that you will audit and analyze each other's writing as a team and take the time and make the commitment, it'd be fantastic because you'd have two other students checking each one's paper. That'd be absolutely marvelous. And you could do a background check, a Google search on certain authors that the other colleague student, colleague participant used, and um, wake up and uh, help each other out in that way. Um, 